So I'm Rachel Woody. I'm here with Doc Wilson. It is January 13th, and we're here in the Austin Reading Room in Nicholson Library. And Doc, my first question for you is one that we always start with when it's a wine person, and that's why wine? Ah, uh, why wine? Well, um, when, I was, when I was growing up, uh, I was influenced by James Bond. I mean, he had that continental type of flair and everything, you know, and, and uh, in his movies he drank Bollinger champagne mm -hmm. and he always had the the right drink you know that he would go to the the con film festival and check in the hotel and every year at the same time and then he'd go down to the bar and, and the bartender would be the same bartender he sent every year and and it was uh, uh he turned around oh mr bond your usual sir and he hadn't been there in a year and a guy knew what he wanted so i sort of had this continental flair and and uh, growing up I, I was drinking scotch rot gut scotch and then um when i actually when i was i was selling a lot of wine in a tavern and then when i got to jake's crawfish in portland um they had this like i said that that oregon wine list and that's when he developed the taste i was telling you about well, there was only like 14 wines in the separate wine list that mr mccormick wanted to promote oregon wine so what he did was uh, put out this separate wine list. And so that was uh, when I started, uh, I, I'm selling a product. I'm selling seafood, I'm selling wine, wine so, and beer. So I had to learn about the products I was selling to make a better salesman. I was in the restaurant business. So I, uh, I decided to show these people where we're selling our wines by going to the Astoria and Newport seafood festivals. Mm -hmm. And I'd show them the wine list and then they'd, they'd They'd, uh, uh, oh, Doc, you're selling our wine. Yeah, yeah, really. And so it says, what would you like to taste? Well, I'd like to taste the Pinot Gris. Well, how much do I owe you? Oh, Doc, since you're, you know, since you're selling our wine, we won't charge you. So I was very popular with all my friends because all my friends would come down with me and they would, you know, they get free taste too. Mm -hmm. But the idea is learning about wine and the, and the taste and the different nuances in wine by tasting the wines. I was able to, to educate my palate as well as then taking a formal wine tasting class at Harris, uh, class at Harris Wine Cellars. The wines from around the world, 10 weeks of pretty intensive stuff. Everything from Retsina to Sauternes, which is one's a quite a gamut of the range. So I got a good idea to handle on the wines. Plus I went to visit these wineries and I did a promotional, educational um, tasting for our Jake's employees. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I set up this projector and I took the slides that I took of the early Oregon wine industry and showed them the, uh, the slides. And so they get a sense of place with with the wine they're tasting so that's basically how it first first came about as just uh, when i kept at jake's everything was more focused on the product that i was selling mm -hmm. so. can you talk to us about the evolution of wine at jake's especially the focus on oregon wine and your participation in that evolution well the thing was is that i would sort of become the the oregon ambassador to wines all the, the the winemakers i brought in john paul's first wines from cameron i brought in mark Vlasic's first wines from saint innocent and going even further after i, I made a sojourn to california um, uh, i brought in the first jay sparkling wine from judy jordan from jordan winery in sonoma and with these winemakers, I'd see them because they would they'd be hawking their wares or they'd go to the old tasting room at, at uh, Ponzi, which is still there. And uh, I would go to these things and then show them the wine list. And we further expanded our wine list because we were selling a lot of wine. In fact, uh, John Paul Cafe Mingo was the only place selling more um, John Paul's Cameron Chardonnay than we were. But that's because that was the only Oregon wine they had on the list. So, right. you know, so. Anyway, that, it just evolved that, that way of meeting these people. And then, um, like in 1987, the uh, uh, Pinot Noir Festival started. And I was, you know, I was there. And then I worked at uh, Pinot Noir Festival as a volunteer for several years. And then I just started going to the Sunday tasting. So I've been to every one of the IPNCs and uh, meeting the people, meeting foreign wineries, and meeting new wineries from down south because they have some Oregon wineries that I hadn't gotten to. So I made a sort of a point to go down to, to places like Abacella, Henry Estate, and I got good friends with Scott Henry and knew er Earl and Hilda Jones really well from Abacella. And, and so I, I got to meet all these people that I don't ordinarily meet here in Yamhill Valley or Willamette Valley. And uh, so um, I, uh, 
in, in later evolution, when I was buying all the wines for Jake's in 89 and 90, and Richard Miroshiro was the general manager, and he, the reason I bought the wines, I'd had seven years experience. I'd been going to California, doing the same thing I did with the Oregon uh, wine mm -hmm. list, taking the, the regular wine list, going to Franciscan, going to Mondavi, going to, to Camus, and I'd show them the wine list, and then we'd, we'd taste the wines and, and uh, show them what we're the retail markup was on these wines and so they really appreciated me coming down and, and so on and so forth. So you learn a lot by tasting. And so the evolution of the wine list um, came about with uh, Richard uh, didn't have a, a, it had some new managers that didn't know anything about wine. Richard, Richard used to work in a restaurant so he knew about wines. So he says, Doc, one day a week I'll pay you the princely sum of eight dollars an hour. One day a week from 12 to 5 and I would sit in the bar at Jake's and I would have eight or nine, at that, that time there were only like nine wholesale distributors, you know, and the Henny Hinsdale and Admiralty and, and Columbia and uh, Lemma and I would uh, have these people come in and I says, don't bring me any crap because I'd have seven years experience, I've been tasting Oregon wines, California wines, so they would bring me wines and I'd just sit down with them and I'd either buy the wines or um, or not, depending on what there was. And the, one of the things I, I told you before was the, about, uh, we'd been, in 1989, we, we, Richard came up to me and said, I've got good news and I got bad news. What's the good news? The good news is we sold $40,000 a bottle of wine in the month period. And I says, well, that's great. What's the bad news? The bad news is uh, it, two thirds of it was upper end wine. And I says, well, wait a minute. Didn't we make a profit at that upper end wine? Yes. Uh, didn't we justify our fine wine program? Yes. So what's the problem? He says, two thirds of it, the upper end wine. We take a smaller markup on upper end wine than we do lower end, and it wasn't the profit percentage the corporate wanted to see. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I told you before, I like scraping my nails on a backboard. Jeez. You know, so what do I got to do to keep the fine wine program? You got to lower the cost of the house parts to bring the PC into line. So I, uh, I was buying Sebastiani Dry Sauvignon Blanc for $2.15 a bottle, selling it for $4 a glass, and that was to keep the fine wine program. So again, the corporate thing that's even more prevalent now, uh, it was still alive in the, in the late 80s and early 90s in, in Oregon. And so the Oregon wine list, I constantly went out and visited some of these festivals when there was wine tastings, and I met uh, um, the Willamette, Willamette Valley Vineyard was just about the same time I became a vineyard partner in Ridgecrest Vineyards. Harry Pearson Nedry, uh, uh, the owner, uh, uh, needed to raise some money, so for he had 39 par partners that contributed $10,000 a piece uh, to be part of the Ridgecrest uh, uh, community. And uh, later on, he bought, it, uh, bought all the partners out. So he'd have the, so I became a partner in Ridgecrest, and so I uh, poured wine for Shehalem as part of my penance. And uh, they would pay me in wine, which they can't do these days because they have, they have salaried employees. Okay, so I had this um, thing of this wine wizard thing came about then with Harry Peterson Edry, is that. Um, people would come Memorial Day and Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving the weather would be horrible, you know. And I'd pour Pinot Gris or, or uh, Chardonnay, and, uh, and so the winery, people would come in and the weather was really bad, and so I wanted to brighten up sort of the thing. I had wine trivia cards, so I had these wine trivia cards, and I, I, people loved it to, to do wine trivia, to educate people about wine. Mm -hmm. So I had these wine trivia cards, and I would say, well, you have you have three chances to go to the next. If you don't answer any of the questions, you can't go. And I poured my wine wizard because I'm the wine wizard. I have a wand, a cape, oh, wow. and everything. Oh, no, it's a whole costume. <laughs> and the, the people got really got a kick out of it, you know. And so I just kept doing it at Shehalem all the time. And mm -hmm. and so uh, uh, you know, they they would you know. And some of them, I, I'd find okay, you missed three questions. Go ahead, you know. But but it was I, I can remember Shehalem would be the first winery right across from Rex Hill or the last winery going on Memorial Day or Thanksgiving when all these wineries were open. So uh, I remember it was a quarter to five and we close at five. The rain is coming down. It's Thanksgiving weekend and the rain's coming down. 
This woman comes in the door at a quarter to five and says, Hi, I'm Doc, the wine wizard at Jake's, at, at, at Shehalem Winery, and this is a, a glass of our Pinot Gris. And she takes the Pinot Gris and looks at me and goes, My God, I've been to nine wineries a day, and this is the first one with a wine wizard. <laughs> and probably the only one, too, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's pretty funny. And so I got to do this um, at, at, for uh, Shehalem, and, and even in the new tasting room, I, I played the wine wizard. And I make guest appearances as the wine wizard at Shehalem. And, and I started doing it at the IPNC on the Sunday afternoon, tasting as the wine wizard. And I had this wand, and I would bless the wines, especially the French wines, of course, you see. And in, in, uh, about the time in 87 was when the first uh, IPNC came about. And then in 88, I was initiated in one of the wine clubs here in Oregon. It's called the Confrérie des Vignerons de Saint Vincent Macon. It's a, base, a French based uh, wine tasting group. There's one in California, one in Hawaii now, but there were about seven of them at that, at that time in 1988. And you get a, a, a taste of them with a sash and, and everything, and you learn about the sash. And then you, you go out in the vineyards at Sokol Blosser, where I was initiated. There's Burgundian robes. Uh, the, the, the head of the group, Dickie Rath, was one of them. Uh, Harry Peterson, Nedry's wife, Judy Peterson Nedry. Mm -hmm. And you go out and you're initiated by the Grand Puba, or uh, from California, from the California chapter. And he was a Frenchman that fought for the free French in World War II and came over being the wholesale wine business in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Well, he was the head of the group for years. And uh, so we'd be, the, the new initiates get their silver taste of them. They go out in the procession and then they have a sit down dinner at the winery afterwards. So I would participate in that group. It's once a month, you, you do this once a month. So um, the, um, so I, I got involved with other people in the wholesale wine industry, restaurateurs, people who were in this group, and we'd invite them to tasting and see if they wanted to join. Mm -hmm. So when you're tasting at least once a month, you're tasting a lot of wines and getting that, like I said, people, when they taste wine, they're grasping for adjectives. And when they're grasping for adjectives, if they bounce it off somebody else with maybe a, a better palate, then they get a better idea. And so I'd bounce it off people and see what you, oh, that's what it was. You know, and whether it was pie cherry or bing cherry in, in Pinot Noir, or whether it was, you can taste the oak, the, the oak in, in the Chardonnay, the, how much oak, new oak they used. And so that was sort of interesting to, to learn from that. And then, uh, um, and then also uh, 87, um, when the IPNC started, uh, which that, that sort of made more focus on Pinot Noir as the Oregon grape. And, and also worldwide attention. So the people that come from all the world, the IPNC here at uh, Linfield College is just an incredible event. And, and the best deal is to pay $125 for four and a half hours of wine plus all the food you can eat, which is really a good deal, plus a glass every Sunday. So that was a promo for IPNC, by the way. <laughs> so. So and so the, is answering your question about w a tasting wine, and then I taught a class um, in uh, the mid '90s. I Le Bouquet Garni is the chef de cuisine magazine in Oregon, and I did a wine article for uh, that for about two years, and uh, and I I, could, I they gave me quite extensive. Um, leeway so I could do a funny article and then a serious article about the wine shops and every Friday night there's wine tastings in Oregon so I would do uh, I would write about how what shops offer where where you can sit down where you can stand up and then they'd offer every Friday a, a liar Nelson and and uh, great wine buys and and um, um, uh, vino are the three that uh, come to mind right now there's everyday wine and, and uh, like that but they they do a really good job of educating people and putting a certain type of wine out every Friday night. So I wrote an article about that. I wrote an article about uh, uh, when you go into a restaurant, um, some of the some of the ingredients and some of the preparations are a little bit mysterious to people that don't do in restaurants. And wine, same thing. So I wrote an article wine things things like uh, you know what what what's the best wine, what's the best wine to go with caviar. And is it, um, is it Red Bordeaux, Pinot Noir, Champagne, or Britney Spears? Okay, and so it was fun, you know. Mm -hmm. you know so uh, anyway, I had fun with that article for a couple of years. And then I taught a, a class on Zinfandel at the Academy in Vancouver. 
uh, and uh, taught a four-hour block on the basics of wine, the five, the five S's in wine. I've, I've learned through trial and error, and uh, the five S's. Rachel, oh, are you quizzing me? No, oh, you're sure. All the, right. What, you uh, got a glass sniff. of wine in your oh, head? Swirl first. What? Swirl. No. No. Sniff. Okay, you gotta help me out. It's not Britney Spears. Oh, looking at. See. See. See, because sometimes you can tell tell um, something about a wine by um, the color, uh, especially in white wines. You'll see a wine that's just released is pale straw. As mm -hmm. the wine gets older, it'll turn darker, darker color. So you see it's older and more. I, I learned this at Rex Hill that uh, they released a, a um, an older vine Chardonnay, and I was fooled by it because the color was a darker golden color, but it was older, more mature vines. Hmm. So you learn something every day mm -hmm. by sight and then as the, the white wines get older they turn more golden brown and then red wines like Pinot Noir turn from a bruby red to a brick red and so you can tell there's brick red in the edges you tilt your glass against a white background and you look at the edges you see a little bit of brick red it might be an older Pinot Noir it gives you an idea and then also you look for clarity you look for clarity sometimes in the early days in Oregon wine industry they they're, they they uh, they would do a cold stabilization and they, they, uh, the temperature would go down too fast and form potassium bitartrate crystals that would stick to the cork and go sink to the bottom of the bottle. Nothing wrong with the wine, it's just it aesthetically pleasing if you're serving it in a restaurant. Mm, what is this? What is this? It's, anyway, so you learn about stuff like that by looking at it. And the second S is? The swirling. The swirling. And the thing is you'll see, uh, you'll see restaurant tours uh, uh, or wine judges and white wine is served too cold in restaurants and red wine sometimes is stored at room temperature is too, too warm mm -hmm. so the idea is is that you'll see professional tasters and they'll cup the bowl of the glass and they're trying to get body heat into the uh, the wine to have so that when you swirl and then you cup more swirl because at 55 degrees there's hardly any flavor to a wine right. unless it's a sweet wine right. and so the idea is to warm it up to 65 degrees the optimum temperature for analyzing your wine and same for reds and I got really in bad trouble because of this article I wrote for Le Bouquet Garni um, if the wine has been red wine has been stored at room temperature it's not unusual to ask your server to put the red wine in the refrigerator for about five minutes to get it down to 65 degrees after you've tasted it of course and swirled well, I got in real trouble for that because Jake's is a high, high volume restaurant. And somehow the employees got a hold of the article and put four letter epithets on the wall in, in, the, in the employee's room mm. and said, thanks a lot, Doc. We're buried and you want us to remember five minutes later to take this red wine out of the refrigerator? Well, anyway, so. Uh, this is, so anyway, some of some of that stuff goes on, and so the uh, the, the swirling releases the the, the uh, odors and the and uh, some of the nuances that you don't ordinarily get if a wine served too cold. And then the third S, of course, is sniff, sniff, smell, aroma and bouquet. And then, boy, the snobs come out for aroma and bouquet. And basically, the aroma is what the wine gives to the wine. Bouquet is what the winemaker does to the wine. It's pretty, it's simple, but it's more complicated than that. And then the fourth S is? Sip. Sip. Yeah, so the acids, fruit, and the tip of your tongue, the tannins on the side of your tongue, and everything comes down to the end, which is swallow. Spit. Swallow oh, or I'm spit. I'm a swallow fan myself. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> swallow or spit, and people don't understand spit, but if you're out there tasting IPNC wines, mm -hmm. and all, all the winos go for the French because they'll be gone first and when they go around. So you, you, you'll taste those and you'll probably spit the rest. You know, you know, well, you'll taste and swirl it and then spit because you're, you're, you're probably be dead with, with six, what, 70, 70 wineries at IPNC. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, um, the swallowing it involves the finish and then the finish of the wine from when you're sipping the finish. Of the wine. Everything comes together, the tannins, the earthiness, and the, especially in Pinot Noir, and the, the fruit all comes in the end. And, and a, a, my measure of a good wine with a long finish is that long finish you can still you swallowed the wine you still taste that wine in your palate a minute and a half two minutes after you mm -hmm. swallowed it so anyway the the evolution of the the whole the thing in the wine industry and then i i also in the early 90s i uh, i became uh when the i uh, 
I guess you call it an IPO. Well, now at Valley Vineyards became a public owned winery, and I was one of the first first uh, uh, investors in the winery. And so um, I became a judge for chocolates with wine at Willamette Valley Vineyards and everything. And Jim Bernal even interviewed me for a job, but but uh, I didn't, uh, I did, it wasn't, a, I guess I didn't, he had other ideas. But we've been good friends and everything. And he's even, he's uh, one of my, you know, influencing the wine industry is by, by bringing people in a restaurant, going out and seeing these people and showing them where we're doing their wines and then tasting the wines. That's basically, that's how I got involved in the Oregon wine industry is, is through the Willamette Valley Vineyard, Shehalem, uh, friends with all these guys and then meeting all the people and uh, uh, Doug Tunnell and, and uh, you know, just uh, been great people to work with and, and uh, uh, people at Tristatum, I do wine tours Northwest now and Mike Thomas and Carol Thomas own the business and I take people out on tours and I'll, I'll do a, at Bergstrom, I'll do a, a barrel if they want to do the executive type tour. I'll take them and do a barrel seminar in the barrel room at, at Bergstrom or Archery Summit where they, where the, uh, ironically, the barrel room is on the way to the bathroom, which is sort of like, <laughs> so people can go to the bathroom and come out and we do a barrel seminar and then go back to the tasting room so, you know. So that's basically how I, I've evolved into the industry after 32 years mm -hmm. at Jake's Crawfish and, and into the industry and everything. So anything else you want? I feel like I would have done better at that test if I had some wine. If what now? <laughs> if I had some wine. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Wine is always good. Yeah. Next time. Yeah. Uh, so touching on Jake's before we move on. When they started having Oregon wine on the wine list back in 82, I believe, were they one of the first restaurants in Portland? They to have do a that? separate list. They weren't one of the first restaurants to have Oregon on the list, but they okay. wanted to have a separate list. So they had a, your book of the regular wine list, and there's a little pamphlet just open, fold up mm. on two pages of Oregon wine, and they had everything from uh, um, uh, Hillcrest ice wine, which was in 1986 they had an ice wine, and it was in 375. I think it's one of the only Oregon true, truly ice wines that Hillcrest had, and so we had wines like that. Um, I, you know, someday I'll dig up that, I got that menu somewhere. I'll dig it up for you. Um, but that was one of the things that Mr. McCormick wanted to emphasize Oregon wines. And so he was a big champion of Oregon wines and I just followed his lead and, and took mm -hmm. it to a, a different level uh, of interacting with all these people. Just wonderful people and all the stories about the early days, my God. Just <laughs> incredible stories of of planting different varieties and see if they grow and then taking, buying a garden hose, 600 feet of garden hose, David Adelsheim, 600 feet of garden hose because he didn't know how to irrigate his 15 acres, five of Gree, five of, five of Riesling and five of Pinot and, and he was living up in Shayla Mountain. So 600 feet of garden hose it got expensive, you know, to oh irrigate gosh. the, you know, wow, so sort of cool. So how did the restaurant scene help to educate the Portland wine consumer? Well, I think the restaurant scene, restaurant scene, now, now, now we're sort of a foodie. Portland is a foodie city as well right. as a wine and beer mecca mm -hmm. also. And as far as the restaurant educating the people, um, a lot of people saw that, that Jake's wine list. And so, and like, like I said, when I brought it, I brought in John Paul's Cameron, I brought in Mark Vlasic's St. Innocent Wines. Mm -hmm. So when you start seeing wines like St. Innocent from Salem on the list, Christum, and bringing those, those wines in, and, and people started seeing that, that we were selling, like I said, in 1989, $40,000 a bottle of wine in a month's period, you know. And, uh, and uh, it's because, well, of course, of our volume, but at the same time, the percentage, a lot of times the, the evolution in Jake's was in the 80s, we were selling like 70% white wines. And then the, the Pinot Noir in 1983 and 85 was the great years for Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Bob McRitchie made Sokol Blosser, Yamhill Valley Vineyards, um, put us on the map. 84 was a forget, forget it year. Just nobody, I don't think he, anybody bottled it in the 84s, I'm not sure, but yeah. it was such a bad year. But that put us on the map. And with those, those vintages and having, those, having the contacts with the winery, I was able to get things like, I could go out and barrel sample at Ken Wright and say, okay, wholesale, okay, we want, we want this barrel, this barrel there. And then I, that's another thing, barrel, learning about barrel tastings before the wine is bottled, you, 
you, if you do it enough, you can get good at it. But it, it, sometimes you can't tell. Uh, even with Ken Wright, even with some of the other, even Beaufrere, sometimes you can't tell how good a blind's going to come out in the bottle. Mm -hmm. But by barrel tasting, you sort of get a good idea. Mm -hmm. So with all the vineyards that Ken had, it was interesting to go out every year and barrel sample and then find the best wines for our list. And that's what I try to do, is to keep that fine wine program that Richard started. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, general managers after that, I would, I would try and plug in you know some of the best wines we had and and uh, before I left Jake's um, uh, about three years ago we had a Angelo uh, was the wine he was a wine guy and he had worked uh, at Hall Street in Beaverton and he he knew a lot about wine so we'd have we'd have the distributors reps come in and pour wine before a shift at like 4 30 in the afternoon before and all the waiters would come in and we would taste the wines and Angelo He's now at Jake's Grill, and Angelo and I would taste the wines, and then we'd chase the staff on the wines. And this is the way it worked. If uh, we had an opening for a wine, this, these would be the wines we want to put new on the list. Okay. So that what it came down to is, Angela, if Angelo liked the wine and I liked the wine and the staff didn't like the wine, we put it on the list. If the staff liked the wine, Angela liked the wine, and I liked the wine, we put it on the list. Okay. See that that's just the way it works. So it's we taste the staff on it, and then you know, and if they didn't like it, we liked it, and it fit, fit the price point. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes on the list. I mean, that that was how we worked it in in a couple of years ago. You know, but we'd let the staff taste it because if we put it on the list, they would have to taste it. So that's what wine education, furthering the wine education, and everything. As far as restaurant goes. Um, uh, other restaurants sort of picked up. Uh, I did the first, I uh, can't even think of that Italian chain that came in from California. And I did their Oregon wine list. It was up, it was up by Ringside, right across from Ringside. I can't think of the name of it now. But anyway, uh, I, I met the guy and we sat down and I, I went through the, all the distributors lists. And when he came to town and I did the Oregon wine list. And as compensation, I went to dinner there and, and never Never pay this. At, never pay. They, so that was sort of fun. And then they went out of business. So, oh. well, they went out of business here, but they're still big in California. So I can't think of the Italian name. But mm -hmm. anyway, so anyway, that's that's basically the restaurant business. The Oregon wine list sort of spurred a lot of other restaurants to see the volume we were doing, and we saw that Oregon wine list. Well, hey. Let's put Oregon on the bandwagon. We're doing good work. So, especially in that mid '80s area, that '83, '85, and then we had some good vintages, and then up to in the '90s we had some some good vintage. '98 was a good vintage, and and then uh, the, the the millennia came, and uh, 2002 was fabulous, and then we had 2005 wasn't bad, and then 2006 was a hot year. 2007 rain. But the best people made the best wine. That's what the winemakers learned in 20 years, 22 years. Adelsheim, Dickie Rath, um, uh, and Harry Peterson, Nedry, and and uh, Ken Wright knew that the, in the best, the bad years, the best winemakers made the best wine. So that's what's what's going on. And then 2008, wow, great year. 2009, another hot year. 2010 was the Alfred Hitchcock year. That's because the grapes were so late ripening of the bird, the migratory starlings and robins oh, no. came and mate most of the crop. Some people lost 30 to 50 percent of their crop. Wow. Some people had nettings and one winery put netting out, but they didn't cover the ends. So the birds were smart. They come into the ends and just... Wow. Yeah. So 2010 was the year of the bird. 2011, the latest harvest, cold harvest and everything. People were harvesting in November. Uh, Thanksgiving, I saw fruit coming in from Yoli Amity at Bergstrom on November 7th, my like, lord. And then, uh, and then we had 2012. Mm. Wow, what a great year. What was that? Oh, oh, great story. Great story. <laughs> so Bob McRitchie made, was a sort of, he wasn't an enologist, he was a, a chemistry major. And so he made the wines for Sokol Blosser in 83 and 85 that put Andy Amiel Valley Vineyards, on, put them on the map. And um, he remembers at the winery at Sokol Blosser, Irie's Vineyards are right next door. Mm -hmm. And he remembers this, this story of, um, they had sonic cannons at that time, were propane powered. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, he heard this noise out 
in the vineyards, in the Irie vineyards right now. He looked out the window from Sokol Blosser. Here was David Lett. What happened is the propane had run out in the sonic cannons and the birds were on the grapes. Here's David Lett with a cane and out there shooting at these birds, bang, 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 and shooing them off with his cane early morning. I mean, I mean, I mean, how comical is that? So they couldn't believe that David Lett was out there, the, the, the guru, Papa Pino, is out there, you know, brandishing this cane and getting the birds off the grapes. Uh, you know, that was just amazing. Amazing stories that people tell, you know, in the early days, you know, when mm -hmm. you run out of propane, you know. Right. You got to do what you got to oh, do. Oh, yeah, you do what you got to do, yeah. So, wow, that was a great story. Mm -hmm. So, anything else you'd like to know? Yes. Uh, you spoke of Angelo, and then, of course, we know that you also had Phil DeVito as a peer in the field. Are there other names or restaurants that we should know of as far as, like, really helping to brandish Oregon wine in those early days? Boy, um... In, in the early in the early days yeah, in yeah. like the 80s moving forward who were some of like Jake's restaurant Salishan Salishan Lodge where Phil was sure yeah, yeah he, he probably and a lot of Salishans uh, and people are employees like Ron Wolf mm -hmm. uh, is a sommelier he's now working for uh, wholesale distributor Kelly Dawson was there and a lot of these people moved on to different restaurants and uh, Kelly went to uh, a restaurant down on 2nd Avenue and promoted Oregon wine so a lot of Phil's Disciples were the ones that filtered out and did these these things. And I, Phil took me around, first took me around the cellar, and I, my, I was married at the time, and my wife sat upstairs because Phil was. We, we spent about two hours down the cellar, and my wife was at the bar, yeah, mm. drinking wine, and I brought my wife from from uh, sweet white to dry red, which was an amazing accomplishment, <laughs> and. Uh, so, so Phil took me around and, and we found out our birthdays were the same. So Phil and Jan, and, you know, we'd, we'd get together and do this, uh, we did this burgle party. We've been doing it since the well, late 90s and everything. And like I said, in 2000, it was fabulous, you know, and Wayne Strohecker was a Virgo. And so all these people, Dickie Rath and all, we'd all get together and have these just, you know, there'd be 10 or 12 people. And we just, we'd have somebody cook a, a prime rib or something like this, and then everybody would potluck and bring stuff, and then the wines, just, just amazing stuff that we, we tasted that come out of the cellars, you know. And I can remember um, Dickie Rath, I had the, the, the 19, let's see if I get this right, 1984 Wine Guide and Spirits. And the cover was the Newt C. A. Rath 1980 Vintage Select Pinot Noir. And, I, and the second wine, there were five judges, three of them voted for E. Rath, the other one voted for um, Pinot Noir from uh, Mendocino, uh, which was the uh, Fetzer Pinot Noir. And so that was the second wine, and I thought, well, gee, maybe we should try and recreate this. So I asked Dick, I says, Dick, you got any 80? It's an E-Rath Vintage Select. No, but Myron does. <laughs> and Myron has got stuff back in his cellar that's unbelievable, you know. Myron used to wear the most colorful shirts I've ever seen to IPNC, good Lord. And he used to do, uh, at um, uh, McCormick and Schmicks on Oak Street, they did a Beaujolais Nouveau tasting, and Myron made um, uh, Gamay. Mm -hmm. And so he would down there, and then, you know, and, and the, the third week in the third Thursday in November, around the world, Beaujolais would go around the world, so you have this big celebration down there, and, and Myron would go down there, and that's how I met Myron at, at, at that uh, thing, and I visited him at, the, at Amity for, for years, and uh, so uh, uh, Myron had a bottle of 1980 Vintage Select, and he says, well, I also have my 1980 wine, and I looked in the, in the, the magazine, and uh, an honorable mention was a 1980 Pinot Noir from Tulake Winery in Napa Valley. And Tulake, wine, Tulake's winemaker since 1976, made his own wine out of his home under the Tulake label. He worked for Robert Mondavi for 26 years as a tour guide and a, uh, uh, a lecturer on wine. And so I had met him, and so I said, send me a bottle of that up, and we'll have the state. So we had Myron's um, 80 wine, Newt's Knee Rath Vintage Select, Fetzer 80, and Tulakai 80. So we put these in tasty, and Dick made a roast, an anise-coated roast, and, and barbecued it at Dick's house up on the hill. 
And we went out there and Vicki and Myron were tasting and she's got a great palate. And so we were all tasting these wines and the, um, the Tulake sort of faded, you know, it had faded with time. Myron's had sort of faded with time, but both the Fetzer and the New Singing Wrath were just one, two, as we went through the evening, tasting it at different times. Mm -hmm. And finally at the end, the Erath wine, the, the Fetzer finally faded. And so um, uh, Dick, Dick goes, he says, Dick, the wine is just fantastic. What a great year. And he says, yeah, I knew the rains were coming, coming so I chapelized that wine. And to my knowledge, that's the first anyone knew about adding sugar, you know, to the wine, you know. So, I mean, revelation, you know, 40 <laughs> years later, you know, geez, you know, so. Wow. Yeah, so sort of fun, yeah. So that was one of the stories that uh, that we did at, at uh, Dickie Rass House. But, uh, yeah, the Virgo connection sort of went through. But as far as influencing other restaurants, I think people look at Jake's and look at the success of Jake's. And look at the, the homegrown success of Huber's was another another thing that, uh, and I know Jimmy Louie, I knew him real well. I used to take my dates there for lunch <laughs> at Huber's, you know. And then they, later on, if we lingered, we'd have Spanish coffees, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, and uh, so a lot of the restaurants like that, even though that turkey and ham were the basis for Huber's, they still put Oregon wines on the list. I think because uh, McCormick was emphasizing this on his, at that time there were three restaurants in Portland, two in Seattle, and they had Oregon wines on their list also. So, mm. so I think we influenced a lot of the people in the industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, In your opinion, what makes a great wine? Grapes. Grapes. You bet. I mean, I know some some savies. I won't go into names. I don't want any names. But in in, in 2002, 2008, 2012, and 2014, how could you not make a good wine? Because mm -hmm. the grapes were plentiful. They were great. The harvest was perfect, mm -hmm. and everything. And so it, it starts in the vineyard. And good good grapes. You know, it's not like Dick Erath starting out planting 31 different varieties and see which one it grows. Now there's all scientific and you've got soil types and the clay and the loam and, and you've got the, the red hills and, you, you know, and the, and the different AVAs. And I, I talk about that on my wine tours, about the different soil types, the AVAs and the Willa Kenzie soil and the, the Jory soil and, and the Nikia, Nikia soil and, and the laurel wood soil. Uh, yep. Uh, it's amazing, you know, some of these winers have displayed the soils in their tasting room so you actually see where the roots have to go down right, and, and how right. they, they draw nutrients through that. So so the, the, the education now is just incredible about Oregon wines and, and with Druin coming in in, in 87 sort of justified our, our claim to being Pinot Noir country and, and, uh, and then with uh, the IPNC starting the same year and then uh, now with uh, Louis Jadot with a residence vineyard, Kendall Jackson buying 100 and, mm -hmm. well, 1,100 acres or something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, with another French people coming in, sort of, sort of validates what we're doing here in Oregon. So, being in Oregon, sort of a good place to go for wine right now. So the, again, wine it starts with good grapes. That's what it starts with. Mm -hmm. Of course, the in climate has a lot to terroir has a lot to do with it. Terroir, wow. What a difficult subject, but it's, a, it's a, basically a combination of the climate, the soil, the winemaking techniques, the pruning, everything that goes into making good wine. So, so if you taste a wine, say, from Sokol Blosser, <clears throat> from a Redland vineyard in, uh, 19, in 2002, and you taste one in 2014, or you taste one in 2007, well, 2007, with the rain, won't be as as good as 2002, but the varietal characteristics from the same plot of ground harvested the same way are maybe going to give you the same characteristics, but not as magnified as a good year like 2002. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, it starts with grapes. Right. Yeah. What would you say Oregon wine is known for, and has that evolved since the 80s? Uh, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> a lot of the pioneers like uh, at Hillcrest uh, were growing Riesling. Riesling, a lot of German immigrants, you know, were growing Riesling, and so Riesling became the first uh, uh, grape that was used in Oregon wines, and uh, a lot of people uh, started with Riesling and then used it to gain and get cash flow, and then the cash flow they could start 
planning other other ideas. And with the advent of the, the boys from California, with Erath and Irie and Adels, well, Adelsheim was here, but some of these guys came up, Ken Wright came up, and, and they found out that because of the climate's the same as Burgundy, we're on the same latitude as Germany, that's why Riesling was planted in the same latitude for Pinot Noir, so why not plant Pinot Noir? Chardonnay was a different story, and so we started getting, we wondered why the French in Burgundy were growing Chardonnay, it was really wonderful. Well, they were using a Dijon clone or former types of clone 666 and so on and so forth. Um, so we, Dickie Rath, I think it was the first one to bring in the Dijon clone. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it averaged, uh, on average for Chardonnay in Oregon, it ripened uh, two weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. And it uh, gave a little bit of tropical fruit flavors to Chardonnay. And when we brought the Draper clones in from, from California, if we had a good year, a hot year, we'd ripe, the grapes would ripen, but if they didn't, the Chardonnay would do it. So the Dijon clone, not only for Chardonnay, but the Dijon clone of Pinot Noir gave sort of a triple crown to Pinot Noir in Oregon. The Vainsville clone, the Pomard clone, and the Dijon clone, sometimes they mix them together, sometimes they mix separate. Mm -hmm. So it gave Oregon winemakers a, a good feel for, for different types of grapes, but the same variety. Great. I think that's the most in-depth answer we've heard to that question. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, it's just, yeah, okay. Before I wrap up, is there anything that you thought of while we were going through? Okay. Is there anything, Doc, that we haven't asked you that we should have? Well, the future Rory and Wine, <clears throat> I get that all the time. And, you know, with the, uh, with a, like I said, now is a great time to be in Oregon. I mean, uh, you know, we have these microbreweries popping up. We have, uh, what's really going to happen is this when they, here in this area, is the McMinnville Bypass. And, or, no, the McMinnville Bypass is already here. It's the, the Newburgh Dundee Bypass, and that's going in in 2018. They already got overpasses in Dundee ready to go to funnel people from the Beaver or the Dundee uh, Newburgh Bypass to Dundee. So the, the idea was, I was asked this by the Oregonian, and I says that, that Dundee and Newburgh are going to be um, tasting rooms, a, a wine destination. This is going to be a wine destination. You can go to the coast, you can go to Lincoln City, and you don't have to go through Dundee and, and, and Newburgh to get to Lincoln City. And then on the way back, you can come back and go back. If you're, so people going to the beach aren't going to clog the roads for people that are wine destinations. So Newburgh and Dundee will be wine destinations, and they'll be destinations for absentee wineries. There's, there's already Already, absentee wineries like Cathedral Ridge and has Zerba. a tasting room, and Zerba from Walla Walla. Zerba from Walla Walla, right there, sure. So that that's going to be so. I, I can see those plots of land. They're now um, next to the fire station, across from the fire station, next mm -hmm. to Cathedral Ridge. There's empty plots of land that are going to be tasting rooms, absentee tasting rooms, and that's the future for Yamhill Valley. And then it'll and then it'll spread to the Salem and, and some of the wineries in Salem. That 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 bypass. I mean, it, there'll be roads that you can take um, going from um, the Dundee uh, Newburgh bypass that'll go south to Salem. But that'll hook in with the wineries in Salem. So that that bypass is going to help the wineries in Salem and everything. And it'll help the Oregon wine industry. And what's really great is having an IPNC where they're inviting some of the festivals that some like they, they down an Umpqua festival down in Roseburg and some of the other festivals. It's going to focus more on Oregon wine. And so that, that bypass will affect the winery south of us and then make Newburgh and Dundee a mecca for people that all of a sudden you can turn around and go to four or five tasting rooms and and do like I did in Napa Valley, 14 wineries in one day, <laughs> if you, you want to get voracious about it. You know, so mm -hmm. anyway, that's about all I, I want to add, that, that the future looks really, really bright for Oregon and the second generation winemakers. Uh, Cody Wright is over at Purple Hands now, making some really great, has plans for his own winery and everything. And, and so he won't have to make it at Rocco anymore. But, you know, so anyway, that, that, that's what's happening with second generation winemakers and Wynn Peterson Nedry is another one. So there's, there's a great, great future in Oregon wine right now.
So I'm glad to be here. Still here, <laughs> that is. So. And drinking the wine. And drinking the wine. Yeah. <laughs> Every Friday night we have a, a friends of mine, we go out and one or two wine tastings and have dinner about 8 o'clock at night after going to two wine tastings and have wine with dinner and then we stagger mm. home and <laughs> everything. But at the ICI, I still keep my hand in, even though I'm not at Jake's anymore. Mm -hmm. I do wine tours Northwest and then I, I, we, Friday night we do tastings, sometimes Saturday tastings they have. So that's where we keep, we keep your hand in. Right. Keep your, your palate fresh. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Doc, for well, you're welcome. sharing your story with us. Oh, good. This will conclude the formal portion of the interview. Okay.